Ani Buju. Welcome to another amazing seminar series put on by FishCast. My name is Dr. Christina Semenyuk. I'm an associate professor at the University of Windsor. I'm also, um, as director of FishCast, I am talking to you today from the rainy traditional territory of the, of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations. And this includes our Ojibwa, Odawa, and our Potawatomi peoples. And I'm very, very privileged and grateful to be able to work on the land that I do and do the research that I do here at the university. Um, as a community, FishCast really does try to foster going beyond land acknowledgements, and it's through our workshops that we hold, our EDI initiatives, our seminar series, our micro-credential offerings, that we're moving beyond, hopefully, land acknowledgements that are standardized and more into meaningful partnerships and relationship building so that we could acknowledge our connections to the knowledge of the land and acknowledge the history that everyone has and where we're situated. I think ultimately the goal of our training program, which is meant to train the next generation of scientists in freshwater conservation and management, our goal is to try to work collaboratively with, with collaboratively with others to try to find ways to overcome systemic barriers. And I say this every time, but I feel like it is important to acknowledge that we all are and we will all continue to be treaty land inhabitants, no matter where we're calling in from across Canada and even sometimes in the United States. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to be able to present to you and introduce you today to Dr. Brian Neff from Western University. A bit of a brief bio, Brian began his scientific career at the University of Toronto and he was an undergraduate volunteer so he got sucked into Mark Gross's lab and who himself studied ecology and evolution but specifically biodiversity science and conservation biology and I don't know if it was Mart or the fact that um, Brian had the opportunity to work at the Queen's University Biological Station at Lake Opinikin where it really drew him in and enticed him to keep him on in Mark's lab to um, Mark's lab to do his PhD. And there, um, Brian became a really early adopter of genetic DNA fingerprinting and really made a name for himself. And he did, that was there, he developed some of the first microsatellite primers for fishes. And he also provided one of the first comparisons of the fitness of different male reproductive tactics. And in fact, I think this is where Brian first made his mark on ARTs. And Brian literally wrote the book I'll be in a book chapter with Rosemary Knapp on alternative reproductive tactics in fishes. And it's a great book. It's called Fish Behavior. And if anyone's interested in that, please pick it up. It's an excellent one. Brian then went over and uh, did his postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell University before accepting a faculty position at Western in 2001. And today, Brian's lab focuses on the behavior, genetics, and ecology of fishes. And specifically, Brian studies the genetic basis and it's the genetic basis of the behavioral, physiological, and morphological variation in fishes to understand in both pure and applied contexts why individuals look and act the way that they do. Brian's lab is also really highly collaborative. And he and his team, they work with a number of other universities, industrial partners, and government organizations. And you'd see here on the call today, that's actually reflected in who's in attendance. And Brian's always keen to explore new collaborative opportunities. And while Brian continues to explore this integrative field of behavioral ecology, he and his lab are also really well known for studying salmon farming, the resiliency of aquatic ecosystems to climate change, restoration practices, and other conservation and management issues uh, that are facing our Canadian fishes today. We're also proud to boast Brian as being a member of FishCast, and we actually can't wait to learn more about his talk today. And if you could please join me in welcoming Brian as he tells us all about the ocean's bounty and whether or not global fisheries can continue to feed a hungry planet. So welcome, Brian. We're so happy to have you here. Hey, thanks, Tina. I'll share my screen now, and you can let me know if that worked. Did it work? It looks great. Thanks, Brian. Pull that up. Okay, thanks everyone for uh, for joining today. Um, I'm giving a talk that I first gave uh, a, a number of years ago. Uh, I've forgotten how to count now with COVID. I basically I think I have to add two years to any time I, 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 I think, but maybe this is uh, from three or four years ago. And uh, and it's a, a general to uh, topic that I've had, you know, a long standing interest in, and it really is around fish, fish and fisheries and whether or not uh, we can continue to meet you know, global demand for animal protein, basically to feed, feed feed people. You know, we're approaching 10 billion people by 2050, and we'll talk about 
you know, is the ocean's bounty unlimited? And I do say oceans, but I'm going to talk about both uh, the ocean capture fisheries, aquaculture, but also uh, inland inland waters as as well. And, you know, really focus on some of the inland stuff towards the end of this talk. So as Tina mentioned, the title of, uh, of my talk is The Ocean's Bounty. Can the global fisheries continue to feed uh, a hungry planet? Is everything working there, Tina? I've totally lost you, but can you see the slides? I can. I see the first slide still, your title slide. Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll see if we can get this to go. Okay, so in today's talk, I want to address um, uh, a, a, a number of truths or myths, and I'm going to return to this slide. I think it's my last slide as well, and I'll try to answer these uh, at the end if it's not apparent from uh, from from the talk itself. So, truth or myth: the ocean's bounty is unlimited. It is better to eat wild fish than farmed fish. Farm fish are contaminated and dangerous to eat. Sea lice from farm fish are killing wild fish. Genetically modified fish are widespread and dangerous to eat. And then lastly, fisheries and aquaculture are all about the oceans. And so we'll return to this towards the end and hopefully I'll touch on all of this in, uh, in the next 30 or 40 minutes in this talk. Okay, so this slide summarizes the uh, global fish consumption globally. And this is from the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. And they produce a report that comes out usually I think every few years. And it really is a fantastic report, obviously hundreds and hundreds of pages, uh, but uh, collecting data globally and really providing uh, a snapshot each, each time the report comes out on the status of, uh, of the global fisheries. This from their 20, uh, 2019 a report that shows the, the consumption of food around the world. And indeed, just about every country uh, in the world uh, eats fish and sometimes a lot of fish. So some of the big uh, eaters are Iceland and Greenland consuming more than 50 kilograms of fish per year per person. Canada indeed is a fish eating nation uh, along with the US and we're about average, a little above average globally, uh, consuming 20 to 30 kilograms of fish per, per year. And so that's probably about one to two meals per week, depending on whether you're having, you know, an eight gram portion or a 10 gram portion. So you could think yourself if you eat, if you eat fish, uh, and if you're at about one to two, then you're average uh, in, in Canada. So one to two meals per per year. Uh, this slide summarizes the global protein consumption again from the UN report. And indeed, fish and seafood are close to tied with poultry for number two in terms of sources of animal protein for uh, for four people. Number one is milk. A lot of that milk coming from cows, but also from other animals. Uh, and then rounding out <clears throat> the top six are uh, pork, beef, and then eggs. And again, those eggs largely coming from chicken. So if you look at chicken and if you look at the cow, they're extremely important uh, for protein, um, but fish and seafood being in, in the top, uh, providing about five grams per person per day. And importantly, as we'll see in a couple of slides, uh, fish uh, are especially important in developing countries as uh, one of the only sources of animal protein, so disproportionately so in, uh, in developing countries. This slide summarizes the global fisheries, and so for uh, a number of decades now, we've been pulling about 90 million tons of fish out of the oceans per, per year. Uh, and that's probably a maximum. And so a real key question is, is even that 90 million number uh, sustainable? And as we'll see, it's probably a bit high, high, but we're not going to get much more than 90 million tons out of the ocean. This slide summarizes where those fish come from. And indeed, this is a miscellaneous category here um, on the right. I'm not sure if you see my pointer. Uh, this uh, down here is the the single largest source of uh, the global capture fisheries, and that includes the anchovies and the uh, the lake herring. Uh, also, uh, a key producer are the cods, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how Canada used to be a major producer uh, in the capture fisheries of cod, but now um, uh, largely still our Atlantic cod fisheries is in moratorium. Uh, this, the uh, tuna are, are big producers. This little wedge of green here is the salmon. The crustaceans are key to the global fisheries. So crabs, um, lobster, shrimp, 
than the uh, the uh, sh um, uh, uh, octopus and um, uh, are are here as well as squid, the sea um, uh, shellfish. This is uh, kelp, which are included in the uh, global fisheries, as well as this little wedge is uh, are the sharks. The miscellaneous then is a catch-all of just about every other fish we catch. And they include things like mackerel, seabring, perches, a freshwater fish here, tilapia, another freshwater fish, and uh, and of course the flatfish. And so, uh, one of the issues that I want to talk about today is that whether. Um, whether the, the that 90 million number is sustainable and the truth of it is that we are just extremely efficient at catching fish. Uh, they're really the last animal that we hunt on this planet as opposed to farm and we're going to talk about that issue in a moment. And so this is an armada of boats that are vying during what's often a very short fishing season, uh, in this case for Pacific salmon. And not only are there a lot of boats, a lot of nets, but they employ sophisticated technologies, including here, uh, a spotter who basically flies around looking for schools of fish that are returning and then can radio down to uh, the fleet or to their boats. And uh, those boats can then quickly, um, you know, go over to where the fish are and catch them. Uh, so we're extremely efficient at catching fish. Indeed, and at the global scale, it's very, very hard to regulate. Uh, indeed, the way the UN actually tracks regulations is just the number of boats, fishing boats that are produced each year and that are in service. We are so efficient though that, uh, but not always uh, in, in the best of ways. So this slide shows different methods that are used to catch fish. Uh, and unfortunately, although we're good at catching fish, uh, it's not it's not without uh, potential consequences. So on the upper left here, we have a bottom troll. Uh, uh, which um, um, uh, basically is used to catch any bottom dwelling fish uh, or shrimp and um, and unfortunately is extremely destructive. So it often decimates the ecosystem down on 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 the bottoms of lakes and, and oceans. Bycatch is another significant issue with uh, with our fisheries. So gill nets uh, here's a uh, uh, seal. Uh, that's uh, in, you know ensnared in this net and, and, and dead. So bycatch is significant, not just of unwanted mammals, but also of unwanted fish, which are often then just swept overboard uh, and uh, and not kept. Um, this is a purse seine down here, and again, we're extremely efficient. So capturing complete schools of fish, and uh, and so this can um, obviously reduce population sizes very quickly. And then on the left, on the lower left here is just an example of the crab fisheries. You know, often that was made famous by the deadliest catch, if you've ever seen that show, but out in the uh, Bering, Bering Seas, for example, where large, uh, large pods and, uh, and cages are used to catch, uh, catch the fish. So perhaps the elephant in the room is uh, is global population size, and as I, I suggested, um, there's uh, projected to be 10 billion people on this planet by 2050, and so there's a lot of mouths to feed. And so the broader issue is probably just curtailing population growth, but I'm not going to really touch that one today. This is kind of like my where's Waldo. In fact, I have pasted Trevor. Uh, picture into this slide, so uh, those of you that want, I can send it to you later. You can try to find Trevor. OK, so, you know, the question was, are our capture fisheries uh, sustainable or uh, are we uh, over exploiting our, our fisheries at that 90 million million number? And this is data that's collected again from the F the FOA and also the late Jeff Hutchings uh, did a lot of work in this area uh, around the sustainability of, uh, of our global fisheries. And so what I plotted here is from 1974 to 2014 the status of the global fisheries. And there is virtually no fish in the oceans and in our inland waters that we aren't fishing, that if we can catch it, we are, and we are eating it. And so over the years, as we see more and more stocks are overexploited, indeed about one third are now classified as overexploited. And so this classification basically means we're catching more fish each year than, uh, than the population uh, can sustain or basically replenish. So the populations are in decline and usually in steep decline. And this is something that Jeff Hutchings did a lot of work on uh, trying to classify this and make it well known what stocks were overfished. 
two thirds of stops are fully exploited. But the question is, you know, are they sustainably exploited or are we overfishing them? And in fact, as this graph would suggest, driving these population into that over exploited um, uh, category. And then only about uh, maybe 5% today are considered moderately exploited. So uh, these include really fish that I personally wouldn't want to eat, but, but are caught and eat like this lizard fish here. Um, the, an example of the fully exploited would include the salmon, so a species that uh, I've worked on and many of you have worked on uh, here, including with yellow island aquaculture. And then overexploited uh, species, as I alluded to, include the cod, particularly the Atlantic cod um, on Canada's eastern seaboard, which was once, you know, Canada's pride and joy uh, in terms of our, our, our fisheries and our contribution to the global fisheries. But in 1992, uh, moratorium was enacted because we basically just caught all the cod and there weren't really any left. And indeed, unfortunately, whereas the cod fisheries was once Canada's pride and joy, of our of our fisheries it's now written up in conservation biology textbooks policy textbooks as a classic example uh, of uh, government mismanagement of a, of a fisheries and indeed it's led to many books uh, this one by uh, michael harris lament for an ocean says here the collapse of the atlantic cod fisheries a true crime story and down here in the subheading the ecological disaster of the century the political scandal of the decade and so today the cod fishery still has not uh has not recovered so this slide summarizes then uh this issue you know can we feed a hungry planet and so i've got a double bar graph here so on the left is the production from our oceans and in our inland lakes and millions of tons of fish and seafood uh it's increased steadily from 1950 uh, to today where we're at about 90 million tons per per year and that's probably the maximum that we can get out of the oceans and indeed it's probably a bit too high to be sustainable as we saw in that earlier graph where more and more of the the fisheries were being uh, are moving up into the overexploited category on the right side then in this uh, yellow or gold line here is the goal population and so we're sitting at about 8 billion today with the forecasted of hitting 10 billion by 2050 and so the big question is how are we going to feed all these people so we were initially from the 50s through to the end of last century uh, just catching more fish from the ocean and you could see that that catch kept pace with population growth but uh, since about uh, the end of last century, where we peaked at about 90 million tons, we have not been able to keep pace with the growing population. And so the question is, how are we going to meet this food gap, particularly for animal protein and in countries where other sources of protein aren't as readily available? We've done that predominantly by farming. And so, as I showed in that earlier slide, beef, so the cow is a key component of this, pork is a key component of this, the chicken and the eggs are a key component of this. And as I mentioned, fish really are, up until more and more recently, uh, one of the, the last species that we actually hunt uh, to, to eat. You know, we no longer hunt, you know, cows, pigs, or jungle fowl. Uh, we farm them, we've domesticated them, and we farm them in a highly efficient and highly controlled environment. And what I will argue is that uh, to meet global demand for animal protein, we have to shift from uh, hunting or the capture fisheries. They're still going to be a key component of, uh, of, the, uh, of meeting global demand at 90 million tons. It's a lot of protein, uh, but we have to really look to also farm fish, just like these other domesticated animals. And indeed, farming has exploited has exploded in uh, in the last few decades as a major, major growth industry uh, for food. And this has been picked up by Time, for example, in this issue where it says the future of fish, can farming save the last wild food? And indeed, uh, aquaculture is the fastest uh, food growing industry has been for a number of decades, peaking at about 7% annual growth. And it now provides more than half of all food fish eaten. So more than the capture fisheries now at 120 million tons per year. And so this is a slide here in the upper left. We have uh, inland ponds basically that are used to farm fish like uh, carp, which is the number one farm fish largely in Asia, but also tilapia has grown enormously in both Asia and Africa. And those of you that go to the, uh, the grocery store will see tilapia is readily available in our own supermarkets now. And so are the among the top uh, fish that are farmed. 
I liked salmon, and as you, you, you know, and many of you have worked with, uh, with uh, Yellow Island Aquaculture. This is a picture of their farm, the Seeing Eye, on the west coast uh, uh, of, uh, of Canada. And so salmon are a key, key part of the farming industry as well. And these are open net pens here, shown in the picture. So indeed, when we look at the contribution, we add aquaculture to the capture fisheries. So the gray, the green here is the capture fisheries. The the blue, blue gray color here is the uh, is the uh, aquaculture. We see that in fact the food gap is being met by aquaculture, and it's being fully met. And indeed, the capacity of aquaculture to grow in Canada and globally is slated to uh, outpace population growth. And so for some time to 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 come aquaculture can meet this food gap <laughs> indeed uh, and potentially have surplus and importantly aquaculture uh, is disproportionately meeting the demands in developing countries uh, for animal protein uh, particularly in countries where other sources of protein plant protein just aren't as readily available However, as you know, as I, I alluded to with the truth or myth, there are concerns around fish farming and our practices. And this is just a collage of some headlines. So, you know, more rapid and severe disease outbreaks from aquaculture at the tropics. Uh, the price for lice, we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, uh, farmed and dangerous. Uh, you know, farming isn't the answer. Toxic salmon. So there's been a lot of, you know, not so great press around farming fish farming in particular. And indeed, you know, as one example, studies have shown that farmed fish can be uh, can be toxic, as that one headline suggested. This is a work done by Heights et al. in 2004, where they quantified the PCBs in farmed fish. So the blue bars here on the left, um, salmon taken from Scotland, Norway, Eastern Canada, BC, Chile, the green bars are then wild salmon for comparison, but indeed there's PCBs in these fish and PCBs aren't stuff that you want to be eating. In fact, some levels are quite high, like in Scotland, up at 50 nanograms per gram. So well above any recommended uh, intake level of PCBs. And so this is an issue. So they can be toxic. Uh, that said, you know, wild fish just by, you know, just by the fact that they're wild can also contain PCBs and indeed sometimes quite high levels like in this study the Chinook salmon that were caught in BC were quite high and uh, almost as high as the uh, farm fish in Chile. So being wild doesn't mean that they're contaminant free as well and part of that issue is just that we're polluting our oceans. We're putting these PCBs in our oceans and in our lakes. Uh, in the case of the farming though the solution at least in principle is really easy. This study also nicely showed that um, the uh, PCBs in the farm fish were coming from the feed that we were feeding them. So it's pretty easy, you know, don't feed them PCBs and they won't have PCBs in them. Uh, there though, then the answer is a little bit more complicated than just getting the PCBs out of the feed. And that's because um, the feed predominantly relies on, on wild capture fisheries to create. So fish meal and fish oils, and that comes predominantly from anchovies and uh, Pacific herring. And those are coastal coastal species um, that uh, are contaminated again because we're dumping these PCBs into our oceans uh, and and into our lakes. And so the problem to clean up the uh, the feed is a little bit harder. You know what what will be the source of the protein in the feed that we need so that we can grow the fish in the farm? And indeed, this is some work that my lab has tried to address. Uh, done in partnership with uh, with uh, a feed company out uh, on uh, on the west coast, as well as at Yale Yale Island Aquaculture, and it was uh, done by a graduate student of mine, Kat Dowdy, who's shown here in the upper uh, right um, uh, slide at Yellow Island. And what we did is we basically wanted to develop a new diet, you know, a new fish feed. So we're working with that feed company. And we wanted to substitute the fish meal, which is the source of the PCBs when we rely on wild fish that we catch, like the, uh, the anchovies and the herring, and replace it with a low fish meal uh, food, but where we were substituting that meal, so the protein sources, with chicken, and so over here. So just replace the fish in the feed with the chicken. We picked chicken because chicken is a highly regulated, highly regulated industry. It's uh, the price, it doesn't fluctuate unlike, unlike the capture fisheries, and it's uh, very clean. 
And so we created two feeds, one that had the high fish meal, the other that had the low fish meal, and then we tried to keep everything else the same. Okay, and what did we find when we fed the fish uh, up to harvest? So up to about, I think they were probably two to three kilograms when they were, were, were harvested. And so what we found is that when we looked at specific growth rates, so a key metric in, uh, in, uh, in aquaculture comparing the high fish meal on the left versus the low fish meal, so the ones that had the chicken instead of the fish, in it, we found no difference. So this was really good news. So we could make this substitution in the feed and uh, maintain a high growth rate of the fish. So they liked it. They weren't picky. They didn't need to eat fish. They were happy to eat chicken instead. When we looked at body fat, this was another key component of, uh, of, uh, of the fish, and particularly the omega fatty acids, which are a key selling point of salmon. We found that there was no difference. And in fact, the low fish meal had slightly higher levels, albeit this difference wasn't significant. So another you know, thumbs up. So two thumbs up to the, uh, to the, uh, the new, fish, uh, the, the new uh, fish food that we had created uh, in partnership. Um, However, when we filleted the fish and looked at them, uh, we had a problem. So on the left here, we have the high fish meal, which is kind of the classic what, you know, the industry, the consumers are looking for when they buy salmon. So they want that nice red or pink flesh. On the right, we have the uh, same chinook salmon, but that were fed the low fish meal. So the ones that had been substituted with the chicken. And here, the color, which comes largely from carotenoids, so atazanthin being one of the key carotenoids, just wasn't getting deposited in the flesh. So it was lacking that nice red pink coloration. Indeed, it looked more like a chicken breast. Uh, and, and these just would not have market value. So people buying salmon do not want you know, a pale colored flesh. And so this project's uh, on hold at the moment, but we do have some ideas where we think uh, carotenoid sothoxanthin is a precursor for vitamin A. If you cleave it in half, you basically get the vitamin A. And it's possible that uh, even though we spiked our, our feed with vitamin A, that the, um, the uh, high fish meal diet was introducing far more vitamin A than we were adding and getting from the chicken. And so it's possible that if we just add more vitamin A to the low fish meal, we might be able to restore the use of the carotenoids uh, in these fish and hopefully get the deposition of the carotenoids in the flesh so we maintain that nice color. Right now, this, uh, this uh, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't sell in the supermarket. Okay, another issue or truth or myth that I wanted to address was the was around sea lice. And so there's been a lot of concern on the East Coast or on the West Coast, sorry, around farms. So particularly salmon farms infecting wild fish as they migrate out. So particularly the young fish, the smolts as they, they come out of the freshwater rivers enter the ocean. And uh, here is uh, some data from pink salmon. It's just a schematic where some, uh, a large number of the pinks will migrate up along the coast and past Discovery Islands, as well as Broughton Archipelago, where there are just all, there are or soon to be were, because a lot of these fishing licenses have been revoked by the BC government, in part because of the lice, the lice concerns but that the uh, wild fish then, as they migrate up, pass by these fish farms. And fish farms often do have issues with sea lice in the farm, partly because of the high density and the ease of transmission of sea lice. And so as these wild fish pass by, the, the many researchers, but the concerns were that the wild fish, the smolts were picking up the lice and then dying. And indeed there was a, a large outbreak of sea lice in the, uh, in these fish farms in 2001 and then in 2002 there was a big collapse of the pink salmon uh, wild fish returns and so there was a lot of finger pointing at the farms as being the source of this collapse and so that's shown here so the sea lice are a marine parasite you can see them on in the upper uh, fish here as well as on a juvenile fish here and so the question is though are the farms the source of, of the sea lice and of the collapse of the pinks in the tooth in 2002 uh and and the answer is it's not clear so studies have shown that juvenile salmon may be exposed to sea lice when they migrate pa past fish farms so they certainly can pick up the sea lice from the farms as they swim past in 2001 90 percent of juvenile pink salmon in broughton archipelago had sea lice suggesting a possible cause of the 2002 collapse However, these are, you know, tough questions to address. Is it the sea lice in the farm that's infecting the wild fish and killing them? And uh, the truth of it is we, we actually don't know. So we do know that wild salmon with sea lice infections have low survival. So it's not good to have sea lice. 
However, controlled experiments show that sea lice exposure has only a small direct effect on survival. And instead, there seems to be another unmeasured factor involved that likely led to the poor health and vulnerability of the sea lice infected salmon. So it's probably fish that aren't healthy to begin with that are more susceptible to picking up sea lice and that it's the combination of the sea lice and the fact that the fish who have sea lice aren't healthy to begin with that is leading to uh, to the mortality. And so sea lice are part of it, but not the only part of it. And indeed, there's no relationship between annual sea lice numbers in aquaculture and the number of wild salmon returns. So, but that again, at a global scale, is really tough to measure and try to uh, establish cause and effect. Okay, well, what about uh, uh, um, GMOs and uh, you know, as this slide shows here, it's a live master, but is it safe for people to eat genetically altered salmon and other foods research? So we have our frankenfish here as uh, as uh, the GMO fish that many of you may have heard heard about. So uh, it's produced by Aqua Bounty. It was uh, originally developed uh, through MUN, so research, pioneering research that was done at the, uh, at the uh, uh, university out in Newfoundland, Labrador and uh, then picked up by Aqua Bounty and ultimately produced and marketed in, uh, in, the, um, in the US, uh, but now is readily available. So the little box on the right here says, put it on the market and we'll find out in five or 10 years. And so that is if people will eat it. So what's interesting in a broader debate around GMOs is that, um, you know uh, about uh, advertisement and labeling, and so GMOs right now. So, so this this frankenfish, so the Aquabounty Atlantic salmon, um, isn't marketed as a GMO. So you wouldn't know that it's a GMO. It's not labeled as a GMO, and so there's no requirement to label GMOs in in uh, in supermarkets today. But the um, the Aquabounty Atlantic salmon is now available, for example, through through uh, through Loblaws. Um, so you don't know, maybe buy Atlantic, farmed Atlantic salmon if it's this GMO. So what is it? So this was some work, as I mentioned, pioneering work originally done at MUN. And what the researchers there did is took a promoter from a pout, so another fish. And this was a promoter that basically uh, is always turned on. And then they attached that promoter to a growth hormone gene that they took from, from another fish. And so in this case, from uh, Chinook salmon. So Chinook are the king of salmon, so they're the fastest growing salmon. And so they just took the growth hormone from, from this Chinook, put it with the promoter of the pout and put it into an Atlantic salmon. And what did they do? What, what happened when they did this? And this is of course after decades of research, but this slide shows the aqua bounty Atlantic salmon and a uh, native farmed Atlantic salmon, so not a GMO, one without that promoter and growth hormone. They're both the same age uh, and both were reared at the same facility. And so we can see by basically having that slippy promoter that's always on producing growth hormone, not at excessive levels, no higher than the levels of growth hormone that you'd find in Chinook salmon, but that it's constitutionally expressed. So it's always expressed. And so the fish never stops eating and never stops growing. And so it leads to a much larger fish. Is it dangerous to eat? My answer would be no. This fish was treated as a drug when it was marketed, partly why it took about 30 years to get it to market. Uh, it was held to a much, much, much higher level or standard than any other fish or any other food product is held to because it came through the Food and Drug Administration in the US as a drug, which has much, much stricter standards before you're allowed to consume it in, by humans. Uh, so do I think it's safety? Yes, but it is a GMO. Should it be marketed as a GMO? That's a that's an active question to debate. The growth hormone levels, importantly, in that Atlantic salmon, no higher than the growth hormones found in wild Chinook salmon, for example. OK, lastly, I want to wrap up with just, you know, since fish cast really is focused on fresh water and we're talking about uh, about the global fisheries, you know, how important are lakes and in inland bodies of waters, rivers as compared to the oceans? Is it all about oceans? So do only oceans matter when we talk about global global capture fisheries and global aquaculture? So when we look at surface area, yeah, oceans are a lot bigger, 65 times larger. So when we look at surface area, oceans are about 350 million square kilometers where inland lakes and rivers and what inland water bodies are about just over 5 million 
square kilometers, so a lot smaller. There's just a lot less potential for productivity in the inland waters than the oceans. However, when we look at the capture fisheries in millions of tons, about that 90 million that we were looking at, or just over 90 million, about 80 million comes from the oceans, but upwards of about 11 to 12 million tons comes from inland inland water bodies. And indeed, given that they are 65 times smaller, so the inland water bodies, they produce seven times the uh, food, or, or, or they're only one seventh the amount of food. So in fact, they're 10 times more important by surface area in their contribution to the global fishery. So 10 times more important. And importantly, when you look at the geography of this contribution, they're much, much more important in developing countries where they're providing often the only source of animal protein. And then lastly, if we look at aquaculture production, in fact, it's almost tied now. So when we look at that, potential to meeting the food gap, which I've argued is going to have to come from aquaculture, so farming of, of fish. Inland water bodies are contributing almost equally to that 120, so it's almost a 60-60 split in terms of millions of tons per year. So when we look at aquaculture in particular, we see that the inland water bodies are instrumental. And indeed, if we look in our own backyard, so in Ontario anyways, my backyard, uh, uh, the capture fisheries are quite significant in our Great Lakes. So a significant amount of fresh water is in Canada and in the U.S. in the Great Lakes. And so there's uh, very active sustenance fisheries, for example, lake trout, uh, walleye, sometimes called pickerel, different from jing pickerel. Uh, whitefish, perch are, are a major contributor, largely from Lake Erie, as well as rainbow smelt. Also in Ontario, though, a major growth industry is fish farming, and there's been a big movement. So there's lots of open net pens, for example, in, in the Great Lakes, but there's been a significant movement to closed containment facilities. And so, for example, rain, rainbow trout now are far, farmed in closed systems, uh, as well as open net pens. Uh, shrimp are growing a lot in Ontario, and as I mentioned, tilapia now are growing in, uh, in Ontario, and of course, globally are, are growing. Uh, significantly enclosed systems. Basically, you can dig up a, a pit or a pond in your backyard, fill it with water, and then farm these fish. So in conclusion, I've tried to address that, uh, whether or not the uh, uh, fisheries are sustainable in aquaculture, and I've argued that uh, sustainable fisheries, probably at lower than 90 million tons per year, uh, are a key component of feeding a hungry planet, but that food gap must be met by aquaculture. And so both are going to be vital to feeding a hungry planet. Aquaculture will have an increasingly large role in meeting global demand for seafood. There is still room though for innovation and improvement in aquaculture. And some of the key issues are the environmental impact that they have, as well as making sure that the fish that come out of these uh, farms are clean and safe to eat. I've also pointed out that lakes and rivers are disproportionately important in meeting that, the, in contributing to aquaculture and meeting that global food gap. So if I return to this truth or myth slide, I hope uh, I have addressed and, and, and provide some information around that the ocean's bounty uh, is not unlimited. So this is a myth that 90 million tons per year is probably a bit too high and it's certainly not going to be able to go higher. Uh, is it better to eat wild fish than farm fish? The answer depends. You know, so some wild fish are contaminated, some farm fish are contaminated, and so you need to pick wisely, and I'll show you after this slide uh, how you might do that. Um, so farm fish are contaminated in dangerous deep. Some are. Yes, so that's not just a myth. Some are. Sea lice from farm fish are killing wild fish. That's that's a real unknown, in my opinion. There's some evidence that, yes, sea lice are bad for, for wild fish and that, that sea lice may be coming from farms, but it's not, it's not clear that it's a, a real straightforward cause and effect relationship. Genetically modified fish are widespread and dangerous to eat. They're not widespread. There's only one, and it's the first animal ever available as a GMO for food consumption, and that's the aquabound, the Atlantic salmon. Do I think it's dangerous to eat? No. All the tests that were done on it are far, far beyond any other food would be subjected to as it was treated as a drug as it was introduced into the into the market. Fisheries and aquaculture are all about the oceans. I hope I've convinced you in those last couple of slides that the answer is no, that the inland water bodies, you know, many of them being freshwater lakes and rivers are key 
and indeed that speaks to the importance of fish cast in this network and uh, and all the research that we are doing that you are doing. So what can you do? So one thing that I like is the Seafood Watch app uh, put together by Monterey Bay Aquarium. If you have a smartphone, I imagine everyone does, you can download it easily and it's a fantastic app. Uh, the society in, in Canada that uh, partners with uh, Monterey Bay is called OceanWise, a sustainable choice. And so in this app, you can type in, you know, if you're at your fishmonger and you're looking at tilapia, you can put tilapia into the search and it'll tell you everything you need to know and particularly around four criteria. So they'll, the app addresses, is the species abundant and resilient? So around the sustainability and the way it's fished, is it well managed? So is there a comprehensive management plan based on current scientific research? Is there limited habitat uh, damage? So if the species is caught by those bottom trawls, then it's gonna score lowly uh, by the app, by the Monterey Bay uh, Seafood Watch app. And is there limited bycatch? So in the methods that are used, you end up catch capturing a lot of other fish or other species that then are discarded. And so again, it would um, it would score lowly. And so the app also then provides questions that you might ask to the fishmonger that you're buying from uh, to ensure that you are buying fish that are uh, sustainably managed, uh, fished and or farmed. Okay, I'll end there. I'll try to stop uh, sharing and hopefully you all come back. Mm -hmm. that that was great, Tina, when you came back, it was frozen. I was like, my gosh, I hope I wasn't frozen the whole time. Mm -hmm. Nope, it was perfect. Thanks so much, Ryan. That was really, really great. Really appreciate that. And um, we'll open the floor to questions. So we'll we'll um, cease recording. And so feel free.